Intel's i9-9900K is most boasted feature in all marketing is its solder, or STEM, or soldered TIM, or STEM. So we decided to test thermals with the new soldered interface, then d the CPU, and put thermal paste back on it, because apparently we didn't get the memo. We'll be looking at soldered versus paste tests, gaming benchmarks, Blender workloads, overclocking, and live streaming benchmarks in our review of the i9-9900K. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Be Quiet Dark Rock 4 and Dark Rock Pro 4 CPU coolers. These high-end coolers focus on a smarter approach to air cooling by adding a mini fin stack on top of the direct contact cold plate, adding small bumps to the fins for increased service area, and by using Silent Wayne's 135mm fans, custom built for high performance cooling without too much noise. The Pro is a dual tower cooler rated for 250 watt TDP, while the Dark Rock 4 is built for 200 watt TDPs. Learn more at the link in the description below. Very quick note before we get started, we have a new limited edition shirt on the store. It's this Graph logo shirt that's up there on store.cameraxis.net. Once they're gone, we're not buying more of them, and it's a basically a quad foil shirt. So check that out on the store. So the most important pieces of information, if you missed all the other stuff, the new CPU, the 9900K, is an eight-core part. It's got 16 threads. It costs 530 bucks, and it clocks all core to 4.7 gigahertz with single core about 5.0, plus or minus a bit. You can overclock it fairly easily. We pushed 5.2 without any effort really whatsoever, and we'll be doing a live stream later, which we'll put the date and time on that on the screen, where we will be doing some more serious overclocking. So those are the absolute basics. Intel is calling the CPU 9th gen. They're calling the whole, well, the whole series 9th gen. And in reality, it's 8th gen. It's Coffee Lake. It's Coffee Lake architecture, but it's been updated a bit. So the silicon's new. It's a new piece of silicon. It's a bit larger, die size, which factors into the thermals. But it's not truly a new generation, so keep that in mind as well. Other pricing for reference. This is 530 bucks for the new CPU today. You'll see that we've taken ours apart already. And the 8700K previous generation, sort of, is 370 bucks presently. The 8086 is a bit over that. The 2700X has recently fallen and is now $300. And the 2700 non-X is $250. And you could fairly trivially overclock that to become a 2700X. So basically, you get a 2700X equivalent for 250 bucks. So AMD's most direct competitor is the 8-core 16-thread 2700X or 2700 overclock CPU. And that's what we'll be looking at for gaming benchmarks primarily. So the first thing to start with here on this new CPU is definitely the solder, which we've replaced with thermal paste. We went backwards. We did the opposite of what we normally do. So Intel's STEM, or soldered thermal interface material, is the company's biggest bragging point for the 9900K. They've been pushing it hard, and deservedly so. This is what all of us in the enthusiast community have been complaining about for years now. So we delitted the 9900K, we removed all of the solder, and we replaced it with Thermal Grizzly Hydronaut Thermal Paste to see how does a high-end thermal paste compare to the solder, because not all solder is created equal, and it might not even be better than the liquid metal approach we've been using on previous generation CPUs. So basically, we went backwards just to see what would happen. And cue the clip of talking with Gordon from PC World, wherein... Gordon says, We can't complain about it now, right? It's like, we got it. You can always complain. Okay. So with that in mind, let's investigate the 9900K and see if the solder has been worthwhile. We did a few things for this testing. First, we collected all stock performance numbers and gaming numbers without delitting it. So let's just make that very clear right away. This was all done after the other testing. Secondly, we originally had the clever idea to disable two cores on the 9900K and fix the voltage and frequency to equivalent values as you'd find on an 8086K. After delitting the 9900K and after speaking with Dare Bauer, we learned that the 9900K is not close enough to the 8086K to even fudge a comparison, not even if disabling two cores. The 9900K actually has a thicker die package atop the substrate, which impacts results in ways which we can't account for with our clever trick. The die is also larger which means it dissipates heat over a wider area and will run cooler. For this reason, our 8086K results we ran are actually not as comparable as we wanted. Instead, we will compare the 9900K with solder to the 9900K with Hydronaut. If you'd like to see the results with liquid metal, we'd strongly encourage you to go visit Der Bauer's channel and watch his content. He did additional testing with the Lidding and collaborated with us on our results. We'll be doing liquid metal in our own testing later. And that's Der Bauer mit Acht. Getting into our results, let's highlight the 
9900K numbers only. So just highlight all 9900K numbers. Here's the fun part. First, highlighting the 9900K with solder, clocked to five gigahertz and with all cores enabled and set to 1.341 volts after VDROOP is accounted for. The result operated in an average core temperature of 64.4 degrees Celsius over ambient with ambient logged every second. We also logged current into the EPS 12 volt rails every second, which is very important for data accuracy. At 64 degrees core and 14 degrees over ambient liquid, the most direct comparison is the 9900K delitted running eight cores, also at five gigahertz. This one operates at 69.5 degrees over ambient for a rough five degree increase over the solder. That's 5C by switching from solder to hydronaut. The thing Intel bragged about so much, it's solder, is not much better than a high-end thermal paste. It is worse than delitting and liquid metal, but again, Der Bauer's got those numbers first and we'll follow up later. Keeping just the 9900K SKUs highlighted, we can next look at the six core tests we ran. It's the same thing here with about 63 degrees over ambient for the delid or about 59.6 for the stock soldered version. The 8086K tests are still here, but as we learned from Roman and our own investigation, it's clear that this data is incomparable enough to not bother mentioning, but we wanted to leave it for reference. As for power and voltage during these tests, here's what we're looking at. Power consumption for the 9900K 6 core 5 gigahertz test was not 194 watts, close enough to the 189.6 watt power consumption of the 9900K 6 core DLID to be comparable. The 8 core variation of the 9900K measured 260 watts, put up against 269 watts in our DLIDed test. This is within reasonable control, although the DLIDed variant might be marginally cooler if we were able to drop it another 9 watts. Voltage was also logged and measured. It's 1.341 volts for all 8 core tests and 1.35 volts for all 6 core tests. There was a V-droop issue as a result of ASUS's BIOS, and that's where those numbers come from. Solder is a reversion back to the Sandy Bridge era. This is something Intel needed to do. Even though it's not perfect, even though it's not better than liquid metal, because it's a thinner sheet of it, it's still better than what Intel was using, and this is important, and for that, we praise Intel for at least doing solder, even if it's not the best implementation, the kind that we'd like to see, but it's better. And Intel, this isn't a, a service, of course, to the community. They're not doing it just because they got annoyed with everyone. Intel's doing this because Intel needs the extra couple hundred megahertz that the that thermal difference affords them. Intel has a real competitor now, and suddenly having solder is just enough on this 14 nanometer aging hot process that it can get Intel another 100, 200 megahertz and allow some more overclocking headroom. So this was a necessary move and uh, one that we are at least mostly happy with. It's not perfect. If you deal it into liquid metal, you'll still get probably better results based on what Derbaro was saying, and we'll have our own numbers on that soon. But for most people, we probably wouldn't recommend delitting at this point because the solder is good enough. It's just that if you're really pushing the extreme, then yes, it might be worth going that route still. It's just a hell of a lot of work to clean it up, and we'll talk about that more later in a separate content piece. Streaming benchmarks are next. We define this testing in the article linked in the description below if you want more information. And we'll play some side-by-side -side clips without revealing the CPUs while explaining this testing. For the basics, we're testing with OBS for capturing gameplay while streaming at various quality settings. Generally, faster is a good enough H.264 quality setting and is typically what we use in our own streams. Fast and medium improve quality at great performance cost, but quickly descend into placebo territory at medium and beyond. Still, it offers a good synthetic workload to find leaders beyond the most practical use cases because these CPUs are powerful enough that they have no trouble at faster and even fast most of the time. We are testing with Fortnite and Dota 2 on the 9900K and the 2700X when both are stock. Fortnite is set to high, as is Dota 2, and both are 1080p and streamed at 60fps. We also measure baseline performance without any active streams to better understand performance loss from streaming. Streaming is heavily multi-threaded, so for people who want, quote, multitasking benchmarks, this is it. Starting with streamer side FPS in Fortnite, we observed a baseline frame rate of 258 FPS average when not streaming at all. Note that this is streamer side. This is what the player sees, not what the viewer sees. We'll get to that in a moment. And viewer side is arguably more important. We were hitting GPU constraints at the top end in this benchmark. The lows remain moderately timed at 161 FPS 1% 1 and 117 FPS 0.1% lows. The R7 2700X is next and operates at 200 FPS average for its baseline performance, 
In terms of frame times, we're looking at about 3.9 milliseconds for the 9900K versus 5 milliseconds for the 2700X. With the 9900K streaming at 10 megabits per second and using fast H.264 encoding, we lose about 27% off of the baseline and land at 188 FPS average. Lows remain spaced proportionately to the average. The 2700X drops to 124 FPS average, losing about 38% off of its baseline. That doesn't mean it's worse necessarily because we also need to look at viewer side frame throughput coming up next. Remember, there are two pieces to this. And at 12 megabits per second for medium encoding, this increases the quality at a huge performance cost with the 9900K falling to 170 FPS average with lows now entering worse territory at 43 FPS 0.1% low. The 2700X falls to 118 FPS average when using the 12 megabit per second medium encode quality. Here's a frame time plot of the 9900K at 10 megabits per second fast versus 12 megabits per second medium and baseline. For these plots, the most important metric is consistency of the line alongside the lower overall values. Lower is better, but more consistent is better than lower. We're looking at the interval frame to frame with 16 milliseconds equating 60 FPS. The 12 megabit per second medium result occasionally spikes close to 80 millisecond frame times, which can create a noticeable stutter or latency difference between surrounding frames. And this is why these frame time plots are really important. They're not used enough when we're trying to use them more because it shows results where sometimes they would get averaged out even with 1% and 0.1% low metrics. Here's the 2700X plot. Performance is overall lower as a result of the lower frequency, but the baseline and 10 megabit per second fast results are still relatively consistent. Although we don't see a spike up to 80 milliseconds this time, we must also note that a single frame at 80 milliseconds is not the norm on the 9900K either. We're seeing consistent frame intervals of 40 milliseconds hit throughout the test on both products when streaming with the torture workload of medium quality settings. Let's take a look at some side-by-side -side footage of Fortnite at 10 megabits per second and fast. We won't reveal which CPU is which until the end of this clip. For the streamer, the takeaway is that the streamer gets a good experience on both platforms. Intel is technically superior here, but the cost of the 9900K is a consideration as well. We'll talk about that in the conclusion. For now, either platform looks playable to the streamer. What we need to know is if the output is any good to the viewer, as that is the most important part of the equation. And that's what you've been looking at here in the playback as well. Let's reveal the CPUs and then move on. Viewer experience is boiled down to percent of frames delivered at 1080p 60fps via YouTube. In our testing, both the 2700X and 9900K were able to deliver 100% of frames at 10 megabits per second and fast encoding, which is perfectly adequate for any streamer, really. The 12 megabit per second medium quality setting is entering placebo territory, though it still has some benefits. With fast encoding, the 9900K delivered 87% of its frames within 16.67 milliseconds, or 60 FPS. The 2700X delivered 96.5% of its frames within the same window. We've seen this behavior before and found that Intel stabilizes its delivery when manually managing process priority. This has something to do with task scheduling on each device. With medium settings, Intel's 9900K is impressive in its ability to still deliver a consistently good viewer experience at 98% of all frames encoded. The 2700X delivers just 68.4% of its frames in the same test, a result of its lower frequency. Let's get a side-by-side -side of these two up. Again, with this quality setting, it's leaning into placebo territory. We want to emphasize that the 2700X is still perfectly good for streaming and gaming simultaneously. You just want to keep it to 10 megabits per second and fast. Intel can maintain higher quality settings, but it may be an unnecessary level of quality overall. It just depends on how serious you are about streaming. Ultimately, a secondary system would still improve low on frame times, and it's probably what you want to use if you're a professional, highly competitive streamer for something like CSGO or Dota. Moving on to Dota 2, we start again with streamer side FPS. This is what the host of the stream sees. Dota 2 tends to favor Intel CPUs hard for frequency dependence, following Amdahl's law well, and positions the 9900K at the top of the chart. The CPU outputs 191 FPS average, with lows mixed at 124 FPS and 55 FPS 0.1%. The 2700X manages 144 FPS average baseline. When we start streaming, those numbers drop to 151 FPS for the 9900K with fast settings, or 134 FPS when under medium settings. The 2700X drops to 92 FPS and 84 FPS, respectively. And here's some side by side of the 2700X and 9900K when using 10 megabits per second fast settings. Overall, both are reasonable performers for the streamer. The 12 megabit per second medium frame times get a bit jumpy, particularly on the 2700X with a 0.1% low of 20, but it's not terrible, and ultimately you should be using fast anyway. The your side performance is where it matters. For this one, the 9900K and 2700X both managed to encode 100% of frames at 10 megabits per second fast. 
This means that viewers will see all 60 frames per second when viewing the stream, and so will not be able to perceive a quality difference between the 9900K and the 2700X. They are functionally the same, lending favor to the 2700X for its value proposition, although it is behind in the streamer side performance. If you did want more quality, the 12 megabit per second medium playback retains a lead for the 9900K at functionally 100% of frames encoded, with the 2700X falling to 92% of frames encoded. If you're looking at side by side footage now of the 2700X and 9900K at 12 megabits per second medium, we'll reveal them at the end of the clip. And again, it's, it's not terrible and can be compensated for with a permanent overclock or with a slight reduction in settings for the 2700X's performance. The 2700X does better here than what we saw in Fortnite. Part of this comes down to resource allocation and how the games work. Of course, frame capping for either game on the streamer side would also help and would pick up performance on the stream side, the output as well. Although that may be inadvisable for some ultra competitive players if you need every single frame on your end, but maybe a secondary system is better for you anyway. Let's reveal those CPUs before moving on. Power consumption while streaming is an interesting topic. This chart is for Fortnite power consumption. With the Asus Maximus 11 Hero that we used for our 9900K, there's a stricter adherence to Intel's stock policies than with some of the other boards. This means we see a sharp drop off in power consumption when testing under full stock conditions. The CPU falls to 100 watts load and stays there, measured at the EPS 12 volt cables, leaving more performance available if we were to remove power targets and limits. Some of the other motherboards shipping today will exit these Intel power specs and draw more power than what you're seeing here. It just depends on what board you're using and how well they follow Intel's policies. The 2700X pushes closer to about 120 to 125 watts power draw. Intel manages to achieve better overall combined throughput for both the player and viewer side experience while maintaining a lower power consumption, for which the 9900K deserves acclaim. Intel has done well here to optimize their output, maintain high frequencies, and not suck down a ton of power until you overclock it, which is something we'll do later. This is, of course, at a significantly higher cost than the 2700X competitor, and that's a massive factor that'll play into our conclusion. Getting into the game benchmarks, we start with Far Cry 5. This one runs on the Dunya engine by Ubisoft and is also used in our GPU test bench. At 1080p, the 9900K pushes 157 FPS average, 119 FPS 1% lows, and well-timed 102 FPS 0.1% lows. Overclocked, the 9900K ends up at 163 FPS average for a reasonable gain of 4.5% over the stock 9900K. The 8700K ends up around 155 FPS when overclocked to 5 GHz, meeting the stock 9900K at near equivalence. The stock 8700K sits closer to 141 FPS average. When looking at the i5 CPUs, we noticed a clear drop in frame time consistency as the frame to frame interval became more sporadic represented by the i5-8600K's 0.1% low metric. The R7-2700 at 4.2 GHz, meanwhile, ended up at 111 FPS average, within margin of error of the overclocked R5-2600 at the same frequency target. And again, the 2700 at 4.2 GHz and the 2600 are within variance of each other at this point, and can be considered roughly equal. The 9900K has a clear lead in Far Cry 5, and performance follows a similar trend as in Assassin's Creed, which you'll see later. Both are Ubisoft games, but they are different engines, although those engines may share some code. At 1440p, performance becomes capped at around 147 FPS average, as the GPU is leaned on more heavily. The 9900K maintains 146 FPS average, the 8700K at 5 GHz again meets its performance, and the 8600K does the same, except its thread deficit does pose problems for frame-to-frame -frame interval consistency. The 2700 at 4.2 GHz posts roughly the same performance as before, as we'd expect, because it's almost fully CPU constrained. The overclocked 2700 and 2700X are not fast enough to keep up with the 1440p throughput under normal settings with a 2080 Ti. If we were to boost options to high settings and fully leverage the GPU, then the natural expectation is that all results will be dragged down to meet the GPU cap. F1 2018 runs on the Ego engine by Codemasters, and is our first representation of a game that nears 300 FPS. It's at this point that most people would probably be happy with just about any CPU on this chart, even the R7-1700 and its 183 FPS result. The 9900K posts an impressive 284 FPS average when stock, thanks to coupling it with the 2080 Ti, and the overclock pushes it to 291 FPS average. For the 8700K at 5 GHz, we see a 270 FPS average result that permits the 9900K stock CPU a lead of 5.2%. If we compare the stock 8700K's 248 FPS average to the 9900K, 
The difference is closer to about 14%. That's with both stock. The 2700 at 4.2 GHz ends up at 212 FPS average with lows still reasonably timed. This posts a 27% improvement in the 9900K, although it's sort of misleading as a stat at this point to state the percentage improvement. FPS scales non-linearly. A 27% gain at nearing 300 FPS means a whole lot less than a 27% gain at 60 FPS. The difference from 48 to 60 FPS, using this example, is often noticeable in gameplay, whereas the difference between 270 FPS and 212 FPS is really not observable to most people, although certainly some pros could probably tell the difference. Moving on to 1440p, the 9900K is now squished down to 240 FPS average by the RTX 2080 Ti bottleneck. This limits overclocking improvements heavily and also caps the 9900K stock CPU to 238 FPS average. The 8700K is just behind at 235 FPS, and the 2700 at 4.2 GHz manages to a 1 FPS average. This posts a slight dip in spite of the GPU limitation versus the previous round. We've seen this in the past with AMD CPUs, like in Battlefield 1 from last year's testing. Assassin's Creed Origins uses the Anvil Next 2.0 game engine by Ubisoft and runs on DirectX 11. At 1080p and medium settings, we are minimally GPU constrained in an otherwise GPU intensive game. The 9900K leads the pack at 135 FPS average when stock, and also illustrates that we are hitting GPU bottlenecks at this point. The overclock only gains us 2 FPS, or 1.5%, and so we can't see the unconstrained performance in this game. Still, we balance between realism and proper methodology here, and going too far one way or the other doesn't really result in a great benchmark. Going lower than medium is unrealistic, and so we'll point toward our other unconstrained tests for examples of the top end performance, like F1 2018. Still, the 9900K leads the 8700K stock CPU's 112 FPS average by about 21% when both are stock. Overclocking the 8700K pushes it to 123 FPS average, closing the gap, but only because we are limited by the GPU on the 9900K. This is a realistic example of how even a 2080 Ti can become bound by a 9900K, and so it's still important to show when the gains of a higher-end CPU become capped by even an unrealistically or unreasonably expensive video card. The 2700X was only tested in Assassin's Creed Origin and Ashes to illustrate that it is functionally the same as an overclock 2700, or just below it anyway, so that's here just as a reminder of that performance. In this game, we see the 2700X land between an overclock 2700 at 4.2 GHz and a stock 2700, as you'd expect. The overclock 2700 posts 104 FPS average results. This puts it ahead of the stock 8600K and led by the 9900K stock CPU by about 31%. This is also why we recommend buying the non-X CPUs in most instances, because it's so easy to overclock and you save some money. The 9900K holds a clear lead here. That's not unexpected at this point. At 1440p, Assassin's Creed Origins illustrates a clear GPU limit at 122 FPS average, where the 9900K sits under both configurations. The stock and overclocked results are tied, with the difference being within margin of error. The 8700K isn't far behind at 117 FPS average, and the 2700 at 4.2 GHz posts a 102 FPS average result. Differences absolutely still exist at 1440p, but they do diminish. For Civilization VI, we use the AI benchmark to analyze turn time processing. This is represented in a unit of time, not frames per second, but rather seconds, and so we're looking at the number of seconds to process a single turn. This is taken from an average of five turns processed multiplied across four runs. If it takes the CPU 10 seconds to process one turn, and you have six AI players in the game, that would be about one minute per full rotation before it is the player's turn again. That starts to get noticeable. A faster CPU reduces this wait time. Resolution is also irrelevant here. The results would be the same at 1440p. The 9900K, when overclocked, posts a turn completion time of 11.4 seconds. Remember, lower is better, and so it's leading the pack. The stock 9900K operates at 11.7 seconds per turn, with the 7960X overclocked to 4.6 GHz tied at 11.7 seconds as well. Civ 6 seems like frequency to some degree, so we are seeing a boost in the 7960X from 12.6 seconds when pushed to 4.6 GHz. This statement of frequency dependence following Amdahl's law is further reinforced when looking at the 8700K and 8600K 5 GHz results, both of which end up at around 11.8 and 11.9 seconds. The R7 2700 at 4.2 GHz ends up at 12.7 seconds per turn. The total time requirement to complete turns is reduced by 8% 
on the 9900K versus the overclock 2700, which is the same as a stock 2700X. It's an 8% time reduction in the most suitable comparison. GTA 5 runs on the Rage engine from Rockstar and is our oldest tested title, but popular enough to remain on the bench for now. At 1080p and with high and very high settings, the 9900K operated around 172 FPS average, boosted by the 5.2 GHz overclock to 179 FPS average. Note that we are running into engine limitations here, best illustrated by the dismal i5 results for the 8600K. This is a story we busted open about a year ago, but it's worth reiterating. When i5 CPUs bounce off of the 187 FPS marker in GTA 5, they stutter insanely and instantly hard. To resolve this, you'd actually want to run a lower average frame rate in GTA so that it avoids the frame limiter at the high end. This issue seems to primarily affect i5 CPUs, as we discovered previously. It's clear that Rockstar also hasn't fixed it since the discovery. Either way, the primary focus is elsewhere. The 8700K stock CPU posted a 159 FPS average with the overclocked result at 168 FPS average. That's a market gain, which puts it near the 9900K stock CPU. Like most games, GTA does like frequency first and foremost. The R7 2700 at 4.2 GHz, again, basically 2700X, ends up at 143 FPS average, allowing the stock 9900K about a 20% lead. This is about what we'd expect. At 1440p, scaling remains the same, or about the same, it's just the ceiling has dropped down. The 900K now caps at 160 FPS average when overclocked or stock, as do the 8700K and 7960X CPUs. This is a result of hitting the GPU limit. The R7 2700 at 4.2 GHz still remains below that limit, and so posts a similar result to its result at 1080p. We're at around 143 FPS average on the 2700X stand-in here. Blender performance is up next. For our in-house GN Monkey head render that's built specifically for CPU stressing, the 9900K finishes the image in 20 minutes, marking it as 9% slower than the stock i9-7900X X299 CPU. Overclocking the 9900K to 5.2 GHz pushes us to a 17-minute completion time, roughly tying with a moderately overclocked 7900X. As for the 2700X, that's represented by our overclocked 2700 at 4.2 GHz. Remember, AMD uses the same CPUs all the way down the line, so overclocking a 2700 to this degree is basically the same as 2700X. The overclocked 2700 ends up at 22 and a half minutes for a speed improvement of 11% on the stock 9900K or 24% on the overclocked 9900K. Our next render test is a single frame from the GN intro animation, which we'll just go ahead and replay it back now. For this one, the 9900K finishes the render in 25 and a half minutes, compared to the stock 7900X and overclocked 9900K at 20.8 minutes each. The overclocked 7900X still manages a time reduction of 13% from its thread advantage. The overclocked 2700 at 4.2 GHz completes the render in 26.6 minutes, allowing the 9900K overclocked CPU a time reduction of 22% to 20.8 minutes. Whether that's worth the extra money is dependent on how time intensive your workloads are. And now we bring it all the way around back to the conclusion. Intel gets major credit for doing solder. It's not the thing that everyone dreamed of when we look at the results, but it's still way better than the thermal paste Intel used to use, the Dow Corning paste. Now, technically, the 9900K is also still the chart topping gaming CPU. So Intel gets credit for remaining, yes, as they say, the best in quotes. And it's in quotes because the word best means a whole lot of things to different people. It's not the best value. It's not the best price. But it is the best just in terms of raw throughput. Whether or not that matters to you depends on how neurotic you are about your frame rate. If you're the type of person who absolutely needs to hit 240 FPS on that new monitor and you've got a video card that can sustain it, then sure. But a lot of the time, the 2700X or the 8700K, and Intel can't be mad for recommending their previous CPU, are both fine parts for achieving high frame rate gaming. And that's what you have to look at and figure out to you how much does having the fastest really matter versus having an extra couple hundred bucks. Because AMD's a real competitor now, and Intel's not alone anymore in the arena. So we have to consider AMD as an alternative these days when it used to not be the case. And uh, as always, thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to place your order for this limited edition run for the Graph Logo shirt with the multicolored foil. That's it for this one. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.